and it shines, burning diamonds More and more when your eyes meet mine More and more like the midnight silk rose blooms Weeping rubies more and more when I'm with you Yet how strange, first a flicker, then a flame Growing slowly more and more day by day wick on which our love burns more and more Yet how strange was to flicker than a flame growing slowly more and more day by day Day by day, every kiss is an endless wick on which our love burns more and more. Our love burns more and more. Our love burns more and more. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Maria. I am a lifelong lover, climber, occasional planter of trees. And I'm also someone who kind of lives on the time scale of trees, spends large swaths of time in um, the archives of bygone eras and bygone persons. And what we just heard is actually a, a byproduct of one of those serendipitous dives in the long ago past. I was doing some research on Marie Curie and found kind of by chance that amidst the craze that her discovery of radioactivity created in the early 20th century, there was this fad for all kinds of radium products, things like radium toothpaste, radium shaving cream, radium cigarettes, obviously, and also a Broadway dance called the Piff Paff Poof, the radium dance. And I was like, what is this? I have to find it. And of course, that being the era prior to recorded sound, the only way you could find music was to find the sheet music for it and have it played and hear it. So I, I found the booklet and the radium dance is four pages of notation. And because of the way bookbinding works, there was a fifth page in the booklet that they could put anything they wanted on. And what they chose to put was something called in the shade of the old apple tree, a sweet, simple, singable, sellable song. Come on. And so all of this happened as we were setting this up and getting ready to welcome this young apple tree that hopefully in another hundred years will cast a large song worthy shade. And I thought it was just too serendipitous to not do something with. I reached out to the amazing Skip Shirey, composer, artist, um, enchanter of sound, who uses a lot of antique instruments and devices and vintage toys in combination with the human voice to create these kind of landscapes of feeling through sound. And he made for us what we've been hearing trickling in, settling in these incredible music boxes, um, culminating with the wonderful Lacey Rose lending her voice to uh, the actual song in the shade of the old apple tree. Skip went so far as to hard code in Morse code, which is what he was punching, the species names of all the apple varieties that are going to be on this tree that we're welcoming into the world. And so we were hearing the sound of the apples encoded in Moore's code. And that was actually just one of a million strange, wonderful serendipities and synchronicities that brought us here today. Beginning about a year ago, um, I found out about Sam's work through my friend Sunny Bates, amazing connectress of creative culture. This is Wishbone, by the way, the, the, the lucky dog who um, 
all week has been watching over the the site and the digging and the and the building and and just uh, maybe has fertilized a little bit. Um, <laughs> so about a year ago, Sunny texted me and said, I'm hosting this thing for an artist and he's wonderful and his work has to do with trees and come and you're going to love it. And I was like, I don't need to, need to know anything more. Those are all the magic words. Art, trees, amazing people. I got on my bike through the downpour over the Manhattan Bridge into Manhattan and into this event where I got to see and hear from this artist, Sam Van Aken, presenting his work, which um, began with, he, he showed something he had built some years prior, which was a tree called the Tree of 40 Fruit, a single stone fruit tree grafted with 40 different kinds of stone fruit, which means blooming 40 different blossoms and, and fruiting 40 different apples, apricots, plums, this absolutely magical, otherworldly, surreal thing, and yet very much real, this intimate dialogue between nature and human nature, the human imagination, and the reality of a, of a living thing being made into this living symphony, living poem. And I was, I thought it was the most beautiful thing ever. And at the same time, he, the event was actually for a new project that he was doing. That tree, the tree of four fruit had gone viral. I mean, the notion of a viral tree makes me giddy on so many levels and so hopeful for culture. But it had gone viral and actually the Department of Homeland Security had called Sam and said, come talk to us. This is the future of um, food security and kind of his practice had developed from there. And there he was last year building New York's first public orchard. And that is what sort of that gathering was about. And he was doing that on Governor's Island, where by total serendipity, about a month later, I was about to do um, my, my role in the Pioneer Works universe is this kind of side satellite that comes into perihelion every once in a while and does this show called The Universe in Verse, which is a celebration of science and nature and reality through poetry. So we were, usually it takes place here at Pioneer Works and a thousand people pack into this building. But last October, we were doing a miniature version of it on Governor's Island, right where Sam was building his orchard. And it was themed um, the astronomy of Walt Whitman. And it was kind of um, an extension of our labor of love here to build New York's first public observatory, which is this beautiful invitation to perspective, to step out of our frames of reference, out of our familiar sense of time and space and the contracted focus of our lives and the urgencies and into the cosmic perspective to consider things from a very different space-time um, sort of dimension and then come returned to our lives, both feeling smaller and more ephemeral, but at the same time, filling that smallness and that transience with the great urgency of making it all matter. And to me, an, an, a tree is as much an instrument of such perspective as a telescope, because a tree reminds us that the moment we're sharing, however difficult it may be, is just a moment. It's just a fraction of a tree ring amongst the many tree rings that are our life. And so there was this kinship, Sam building the public orchard, our building the public observatory, drawing very much on Walt Whitman's legacy and words and inspiration. And at the same time, it got me thinking, I mean, I, Whitman has been a big part of my life and I think a big part of New York's life as a city and as a culture. This ongoing question of his peculiar word choice entitling what is essentially the greatest work of American poetry, at least the farthest reaching, which is also a work of philosophy, a work of political wakefulness and aliveness, leaves of grass. I mean, grass doesn't have leaves, grass has blades. So why did Whitman take the scale and language of trees and bring it to the scale of grass? And that title, of course, comes from that very famous line, I believe a leaf of grass is no less than the journey work of stars. And in a way, he's bridging the cosmic perspective and the earthly human perspective through the lens of trees because 
the only way to experience a tree as grass is if you project yourself into outer space and look at the forest from very far away. In fact, we had the wonderful astronaut Leland Melvin here at Pioneer Works last year, a human who has actually left our planet and looked at the forest from the cosmic vantage point. And he talks about how forests look like big meadows, big grassy meadows. And there was Whitman a century and a half prior thinking about trees from this faraway vantage point in order to remind us how full and big our own lives here on Earth are. And so anyway, I'm at that event l listening to this brand new artist I've never heard of talking about his amazing tree project. And I'm thinking all these things. And Dustin, wonderful Dustin Yellen, artist, founder of Pioneer Works, where are you? There he is, visionary man, is, was there. And I said to him, we have to, whatever it takes, procure one of these trees for the Piney Works garden. Um, and long story short, we had one donated and Sam very kindly, um, oh, um, hi, um, very kindly also donated his time and labor um, to help make it happen. And we, we started having conversations about this tree. Now, in the process of that, we began thinking about what kind of tree it would be. Most of his other trees are stone fruit, the ones that live out in the world in museums and institutions and with collectors. But I learned in immersing myself in his world that you could also do that with apples. So you could also graft a variety of apples on a single tree. And that really appealed to me because the apple is perhaps the most symbolically loaded fruit in the plant kingdom. And it's a kind of unfortunate symbology, this biblical story of people essentially getting punished for exercising critical thinking, for exercising the, the creative impulse towards sweetness and toward joy, and uh, for, for choosing to live by rules that are different from the ones dictated from above that they're supposed to kind of follow unquestioningly. And here's Pioneer Works, which to me, I mean, my entry point into Pioneer Works was the garden. I fell in love with this wonderland in the middle of industrial Brooklyn that has become a habitat for wildlife and a habitat for, for joy, for human joy, for community, which is a kind of alternative Garden of Eden where we're building our own rules from the ground up and inviting critical thinking through the sciences, inviting the creative impulse through the arts, inviting community, inviting perspective, which is always inviting possibility, the possibility of a world that's different from the one handed down from culture as we know it. And so in deciding to do this, to do the apple tree, we started having conversations with Sam, how it would look, what it would be, and then something else happened, another stroke of chance and serendipity, which was this plague that we're all living through, masked with our apple masks. And uh, I mean, in the panic and, and terror of it, we couldn't obviously plant the tree in the spring when it was supposed to be planted. And it was a kind of moment of disorientation for the world, which reminded me, I well, I should say, there's a young person in my life, I wouldn't call her a child anymore, she's a, a teenager, who kind of expressed the same sorrow we were all living with of not being able to see her friends, of the boredom within lockdown, the, the kind of helplessness of it. And in my very inept pseudo-parental effort at consolation, all I could think of was to tell her of how well in 1665, when the Black Plague hit Europe and people were literally locked into their homes, boarded off inside to die because we had no science to help them then, and public gatherings were banned, there were no more, um, no more music in the streets, no more spectacles, nothing. Eventually all the universities shut down and sent the students home, and Trinity College in Oxford also did. Amongst the people, the kids who went home was a young Sizar. Sizars were students too poor to afford tuition who essentially were allowed to attend university in exchange for doing servant work for 
the rich kids. So this young Sizer gets sent home, and for him, home is his mother's farm, his illiterate mother's farm and orchard. And there he is, bored out of his mind, no access to his friends, no access to books, which are all at the university library. And so what does he do? I mean, bored out of his mind, yes, but it happens to be a pretty good mind. So one day he's sitting under his mother's apple tree and he watches the apple fall and starts thinking about the apple. And next thing you know, we have the theory of gravity. And of course, that young Sizer is Sir Isaac Newton. So I'm telling this to Stella, my, my young person. And she's probably just rolling her adolescent eyes thinking this does not help my predicament in the slightest. But I got really excited about this question of what can we do in our helplessness, in our isolation, in our moment of um, this contracted pinhole of the present that somehow reaches toward the future, that is a kind of gesture of optimism toward the future which of course is what a tree is, what planting a tree is, putting something into the ground that will outlive us all and that will be savored, its fruit will be savored by generations, by the children of today's children and people will never get to meet and is essentially an open question. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's the beginning of a possibility of answers that we will not even imagine with the minds that we have today, just like Newton has not imagined so much of the world that we today live in. And so with that, I would like to invite Sam to tell us a little bit more about his practice and about this beautiful gesture of optimism that we're planting. Please welcome Sam Van Aken. So, yeah, thank you. I've, um, spent the past six months with a lot of trees, so all these people are a little, little nerve-wracking. Um, so um, I started the Tree of 40 Fruit Project. Um, really, it was an artistic conceit. I wanted to have a tree that blossomed in all of these different colors and then bore a multitude of fruit. And um, as it's evolved, it's uh, almost become a memory project in a way. Um, so all fruit trees are grafted. Um, most fruit are, oh, particularly apples, are genetically unstable, which means that if you take the seeds from a tree, plant them, it's gonna be wildly different than the parent. So uh, when you find a variety that you like, what you do is you graft it onto a new root system. And I learned about this from my great grandfather and I had never met him, but um, I grew up in a farming community and everybody that talked about him, talked about him as if he was some kind of wizard. Right, that he had this magical capability. Um, so I go on to become an artist, but then I s keep making art about grafting. Um, so then we, we ended up here. Um, so as, as the, the project evolved, I started getting invited. Hey, Wishbone. Um, I, I started getting invited to different places and to create these trees. And what I would do is I would research varieties that were historically grown in the area, source them locally from, from farmers, and graft them onto the tree so that they become an agricultural history. And it gives you a way to rethink a place and to remember what it was at one point. Um, New York City is probably the home of fruit growing in the United States. The Lene Lenape uh, cultivated uh, Prunus maritima, beach plums, probably right here. Um, when the first Dutch came, they quickly adopted cherry varieties and started orchards up and down the Hudson Valley. Um, also, as more people started to come to New York, they started to bring fruit varieties, seeds and branches and trees uh, with them as a way to remember their home. And so the, the first fruit tree nursery was actually in Flushing. Uh, it was known as Prince Nurseries and it was founded in 1730. So um, one of the, the apple varieties that they first grew, uh, they found it was a chance seedling known as a pippin. Um, and uh, they, they started growing this, they named it for the town at the time, and so it was Newtown Pippin. And that's actually what the base of this tree is. So the variety is 250 years old. And so where, where we're at with this tree is there's 15 different varieties of apples grafted to it now over the next couple of years. I'll keep coming and adding varieties to it until it has 40. Uh, the majority of varieties originated here within the five boroughs. 
So everywhere from the Bowery to, um, to Harlem, right? Uh, early Harvest, Gloria Mundi. And these were the first varieties that became international fruit varieties. Like we have gala now that come from New Zealand. But the, the Newtown Pippin um, actually was a variety that when the kings and queens of Europe found out about it, they would pay these exorbitant amounts of money to have it shipped all the way uh, you know, across the Atlantic back to them. So um, I want to thank everybody at, at Pioneer Works uh, for making this happen, and Marissa for this is amazing. And, and Maria, this is like, I've never had a planting like this. So this is phenomenal. And it's the one thing with grafting is that, you know, since, since you have to graft, you, um, you know, to preserve a variety, uh, you usually do that every 20 to 30 years, right? And, and the way that you look at it isn't necessarily as you're creating a tree um, so much as you're taking part in keeping something going. And thank you for making this happen because I feel like everyone here is kind of propagating these varieties and we'll, we'll keep them going at least another 30 years. So thank you. Oh, I forgot to show grafting. Hold on. <laughs> oh, so this is just the process for doing it. Yeah, this is bad talk. Um, so it's a pretty simple process. Um, yeah, you just make an angling cut like that. It's about an inch long. Put a piece like that. And then we're going to pretend this is a root structure, right? And we're going to try to match that cut like that. And you put another notch in it. And then you slide the two together. And that's pretty much it. So then you use like really fancy electrical tape to hold it together. So, yeah. But thank you. Thanks. This was a performance grafting, the first and possibly only time in your lifetime you will see it. Um, one of the things, the kind of obvious thing we didn't get into is this notion that of, of New York being known as the Big Apple, which is actually, how many people here know a story, a version of why New York is known as the Big Apple? Nobody. Nobody, okay? Which is normal, by the way, which is totally normal. Um, there, there are several versions floating around, only one of which has been somewhat verified by scholarship, which is that in the 1920s, there was a sports journalist by the name of John Fitzgerald, two words, not like F. Scott, and he was reporting on the horse racing world, the, the kind of circuit of horse racing in the country, and all of a sudden, he started calling his column about the New York, uh, which was kind of the pinnacle of horse racing was here in New York. He started calling it um, news from the Big Apple or, you know, the latest results from the Big Apple. And it was a very popular column. So eventually people were like, dude, why are you calling it the Big Apple? And so he then gave the story of how he was in New Orleans, where, by the way, I just came back from. And on a Whitman trail, he was in New Orleans and he overheard two African-American stable hands talking to each other about the respective horses in their care, saying, where's your horse going next? And says the one guy and the other guy says, it's going to the Big Apple. And this guy overhears this and he thinks it's, he knew the horse was going to New York and he thought it was a wonderful term. Like he didn't even ask why. He just was like, that's a great name for New York and I'm going to start using it. So that's the story he gave. He never went into any detail of why. He never asked why this was kind of the the, the nickname there. And I, of course, being a total uh, historical geek, have my own theory, which um, is basically so in the 19, the early 19th centuries when newspapers in the United States really started picking up as the first form of mass media. And consequently, there was a lot of um, competition between newspapers for readership, which meant that they essentially invented clickbait. They needed newsworthy, sensational titles, and there were numerous genre of sensation, but one was, let's call it, big things. So things like hail, the size of fists, you know, in Vermont, or, and, and a subgenre of that was big farming, feats of farming, so huge pumpkin there, you know, huge squash. And Big Apples often made the news, you know. Big Apple in Massachusetts, 12 inches circumference. That, that was like a news headline. 
So by the 1840s and 1850s, this term emerged to wager a big apple or to bet a big apple, which meant to make a really, to take a really confident chance on something, to kind of risk your best, everything you have, to take a chance on something. And you can kind of imagine how New York City would be that for a lot of people all the way back in the 19th century when it was a tremendous risk and a tremendous act of courage from someone in the South to go up to the North in pursuit of their own liberty. And all the way through the 20th century and now, for those of us who came from, you know, other cultures and other countries, you know, escaping whatever, dictatorships or poverty or just lives we've outlived, and also people elsewhere in this country to come and try to make a life in New York was is is a way to a, to a wagering a big apple. So that is kind of my subsidiary historical theory to the half verified semi theory. Take it or leave it. But I'm pretty confident in it. Um, but as we as, as we were deciding to make an apple tree instead of a stone fruit tree, I was thinking about all these things and thinking very much about the symbolo symbolic symbolic. Um, polyphony of this tree and these fruit that are each of a different place, each with a different history and each with a different kind of cultural historical context coming together and sharing a root system, sharing the ground that nourishes them all. And what does this mean? And, and if, if it had a voice, this kind of apple chorus, what would the song of this tree be? And of course, we live now a century and a half after Whitman, we live in an era when science is actually showing how trees communicate underground using mycelial networks and their root systems. This is the work of Simone Simard and her lab at McGill University's uh, incredible kind of revelatory work of the past 20 years showing that trees do have essentially chemical voices encoded in sugar molecules that communicate to one another and there's this kind of language that's happening. So I, I was thinking about that and thinking about the, the possibility of inventing a song for this tree that is also not entirely invented, that is partly based on its biology and on its biological reality. So I reached out to my friend Paolo Pristini who's sitting right there force of nature, incredible classical composer, visionary, um, co-founder of National Sawdust, which uh, is in Williamsburg and I feel is very kindred to Pioneer Works in being both a place, a, a, an incredible kind of futuristic performance venue where musicians play on instruments often built centuries ago, this kind of link between the present and the future and the past, and also a, a kind of incubator for up and coming artists working in the classical music space, which is a pretty countercultural thing to do with your life these days, and I love that. I reached out to Paolo and I said, can we make something together that imagines the song of the tree? And she was kindly game, and uh, what we ended up doing is I hard-coded the data of the different, I took, I got from Sam the list of the apple varieties that he was going to use on this tree, and I hard-coded data based on things like, um, the average size of the apple of, of each fruit, the, the color of each fruit, the sort of percentage of fleckness on the skin, the year it was cultivated, the place it was cultivated, and various kind of more qualitative historical data, curious facts about them. Gave that over to Paula, who put it in the incredible, wondrous jukebox of her abstract imagination, combined it with her own fascination with the fractal nature of trees, and this thing called it the Linderman system, or the L system, System, which is essentially um, an algorithmic way of modeling the fractal nature of trees. And also kind of drew inspiration from Simone Simard's research on tree communication. And out of that came essentially a sonic language that we devised, or Paola devised, using this data that I took from the tree that's partly an abstract artistic representation, but partly rooted in the biological reality of these apple varieties. And out of that sonic language, she composed a kind of uh, symphony or, or, or choral invocation that would give voice to this tree, to its layered histories with human voices that are bringing together um, 
all this, the, the, the sensibility, the feeling tone of something that shares a structure and a root system, but is also so diverse and so layered. And to perform it for us is the incredible Constellation Core, a Brooklyn-based ensemble of vocally, culturally diverse singers who are just pure magic. And as Sam and Marissa, Marissa are a wonderful land steward who has just been magic making this happen and will be stewarding things into the future with this tree. As they're setting up to actually plant the tree in the ground, Constellation Core is going to sing over it a kind of blessing song that we made for it. <laughs>
I've just persuaded Marissa impromptu to tell us a little bit about why they buried the car the cow horns because it's actually super interesting and it was just her idea. Hi everyone. Thanks for watching. I've never planted a tree on camera before or in front of this many people. So it's really cool to have you all here. Thank you for coming out. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about the cow horns that we buried. Actually, they're, they're from Sam. Sam brought them uh, from upstate, but they're from New Mexico, Arizona. Arizona. Um, and it was prompted actually by my friend Brendan over here, who's a farmer in the neighborhood. And when I asked if he was coming to this tree planting ceremony, he said, are you burying cow horns? And I said, oh my gosh, I haven't sourced any cow horns for the planting. And so this is based on, uh, Rudolf Steiner uh, wrote this, this series of lectures about agriculture that are uh, based in uh, occultism and in magical, magical thinking about plants and how we can be holistic in the way that we're thinking about planting and, and stewarding and taking care of the earth. And so this is one of his preparations uh, for, for health and for, for soil health and also for, uh, for fermentation. So we've uh, planted uh, manure and compost in these cow horns and that manure will spend six months in the ground. And so we're doing it here also on the full moon, that harvest moon, everyone see that moon a couple nights ago and last night as well. Um, and so then in six months we will take out that, that horn and we'll remove that compost that will have fermented and broken down. And we will make some compost tea. So we will kind of uh, percolate that material and feed the tree with that and feed the garden with that. And so this whole idea of, of cycles of life um, and then there are more, more to come also. So these are the biodynamic principles that we're trying to, you know, just kind of reconnect with the stars and the planets, and so also very fitting that uh, Maria is wearing this beautiful star-gazing outfit, um, and we hope we see some stars tonight. So thank you all again. Thank you, Marissa. Um, so speaking of Rudolf Steiner, I mean, there is a bit of a kind of pseudoscience mixed in there with that whole world, but actually um, he is partly involved and responsible for the environmental movement as we know it because one of his students was a woman named Marie Spock, who, sister of Benjamin Spock, who ended up being the person that started the lawsuit in Long Island against the government for the use of DDT, which Rachel Carson, the great marine biologist, heard about and ended up writing essentially the book Silent Spring, which awakened the modern ecological conscience based on following the DDT work for about 14 years. And um, it just so happens that two years ago in 2018, the theme of the universe in verse, which is the show that I host here, um, was Rachel Carson and her legacy. And um, that year, I mean, we've had some incredible people come and read poetry here with us at the Universe in Verse. We've had Grammy-winning musicians and Nobel laureates and just astronauts, really inspiring human beings. But uh, the poem, the one poem that has become most, I would say, viral, and first of all, the notion of a viral poem in my book is right up there with the viral tree. <laughs> the most viral poem of all the years of the universe in verse um, is a poem by one of our great living poets, Marie Howe. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and it, it's, it, it's also, it's unusual for a number of reasons. One of which is that Marie um, kind of half jokingly said in her prefatory remarks uh, that year that it usually takes her like a decade to show a new poem to people but she wrote Singularity very fairly quickly and and it was a great honor to premiere it here. Um, Stephen Hawking had just died and she had been having a conversation with her daughter who studies physics about this kind of complete dismantling of our understanding of reality that his science did essentially achieved for us. And um, so she read this poem, Singularity, and it was absolutely magical to watch 
1,200 people hang on to every word. And afterwards, at this point, probably tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands more having seen it online. This year, it was turned into a beautiful short film. Look for it. It's called Singularity after Stephen Hawking. And somewhere along the way, Singularity reached an amazing young poet of the next generation named Marissa Davis and inspired her to respond with her own poem titled Singularity after Marie Howe. And it is a stunning, stunning masterpiece of a poem in its own right. I, When I first read it, I couldn't believe she was this young. It is a kind of both compliment and counterpoint to Marie's poem because it's a kind of, to me, it reads as a refusal to look away from the brokenness of this world, but at the same time, a refusal to stop loving the beautiful brokenness. And the choice to, to think about what it means for us as creatures to make choices that unbreak it. And it is a tremendous pleasure and honor to have persuaded Marissa to come read her singularity for us. Please welcome Marissa Davis. Thank you. So, well, sorry. Thank you so much. It's such a, a true joy and honor to be here. Um, I had the good fortune to encounter Marie Howe's breathtaking poem last year, um, not too long after I first moved to New York City at a reading um, of the Chancellors of the Academy of American Poets. I'm um, originally from rural Western Kentucky, though, and um, I grew up in the county, out in the countryside, and so the the kind of I, the natural world is always very present to me, and the idea of, I think, our intrinsic connection to the natural world as well, whether in the sense of, you know, growing up quite close to local farmers who had a very immediate reliance on, on its fruits, or else just, you know, watching my father have his morning coffee out back and, and look out and watching the, the deer and the turkey running through the fog and such. Um, and so Marie's poem very much spoke to me as far as just kind of this, 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 this strength of, of our connection um, in both the kind of immediate as well as a, a very deeply historical way to the world around us. Um, so I, with no further ado, um, I'll be reading my poem, um, titled also after hers, Singularity. In the wordless beginning, iguana and myrrh, magma and reef, Ghost moth and the cordyceps tickling its nerves. And cedar and archipelago and anemone. Dodo bird and cardinal waiting for its red. Ocean salt and crude oil. Now black muck, now most naive fumbling plankton. Every egg clutched in the copycat soft of me. Unwomaned, unraced unsexed as the ecstatic prokaryote that would rage my uncle's blood, or the bacterium that will widow your eldest daughter's eldest son, my uncle, her son, our mammoth son and her uncountable siblings, and dust mite and peat, apatosaurus and Nile River, and maple green and nude and chill blushed, and yeasty, keratined, bug-gutted I and you, spleen and femur, seven-year refreshed, seven-year shedding and taking and being this dust. And my children, and your children, and their children, and the children of the black bears and gladiolus and pink Florida grapefruit, here not allied, but the same perpetual breath held fast to each other as each other's own skin. Cold dormant and rotting and birthing and being born in the Olympus of the smallest possible once before once. Thank you. This was absolutely amazing. I, the first time I heard this poem, I cried. I've tried not to today. Um, and now it is, an extraordinary honor. I would say a once in a lifetime honor, but 
actually it's a twice in a lifetime honor to welcome Marie Howe back to premiere with us another new poem. Now you guys don't understand what a big deal it is for us to hear a new Marie Howe poem. Um, <laughs> she's like freaking out, but it's true, trust me. Um, and it's a poem inspired by trees. What a great honor to welcome this new tree into its forever home. Please welcome back, Marie Howe. Oh. Ah, I'm discombobulated. Ah, I had no idea that this beautiful woman sitting here this whole time was you, Marissa. I'm so happy to see you. So moved to meet you. Welcome to New York. Welcome to the Big Apple. Yeah. Yeah. And Maria Popova, what can I say? You're, you're a galaxy connector. You're amazing. Your superpower is beyond description, really. You're a conceptual artist, but you bring in so many people, and you, can, you, you, you unite us all. No? See what it's like? <laughs> anyway, I'm so happy to see you. This is a very, um, so, trees. Um, two very short poems. Um, uh, like all of us, uh, during this time, this pause, um, well, I'm sure some of you, if not all of you, or most of you were here during the real lockdown in the spring. And you might remember that we could hear the birds um, for the first time in the morning. I mean, the birds woke me up in the morning at, in the West Village. And um, so there's something, um, there's a gift given to us during this period, as difficult as it has been. There's also, it seems, a, a profound gift um, that we remember that we're animals, that we live among animals, and that we belong to the earth. Trees. I asked the stand of maples behind my house, how should I live my life? And they said, shh. But it was the wind in the trees moving. The leaves seemed to gleam, but it was the sunlight passing among them. Then the voice that was not a voice said, try to remember standing still, moving, but rooted. Let others rest on you, nest in you. Become the bowl, the bucket, the cradle, the table, the house, the bridge, the boat, the book. But for now, stand still for as long as you are able, breathing. And um, this, other, um, this other poem is um, a poem that was in a, a book I wrote a long time ago now. Um, called What the Living Do, and, um, and this, this is a little poem called the, po the Copper Beach, and I'm sure there are many of you who um, had a tree that you knew personally when you're growing up. I lived in a big stone house. I had eight brothers and sisters, um, so there were 11 people living our, in our house, and we also had, um, well, a lot of chaos. There was um, a lot of joy and a lot of tragedy, a lot of alcoholism, um, and a lot of fun. Um, but uh, th there was a tree down the street in front of a, a red stone house, and the man who owned the house was never there. He had a, he was spent his winters, or he seemed to spend the whole year in Florida. I never knew him. Um, he was an older man. But this, this beech tree, um, inhabited his yard, and um, it provided a refuge for me when I was a girl. The Copper Beach. Immense, entirely itself, it wore that yard like a dress, with limbs low enough for me to enter it and climb the crooked ladder to where 
I could lean against the trunk and practice being alone. One day, I heard the sound before I saw it. Rain fell, darkening the sidewalk. Sitting close to the center, not very high in the branches, I heard it hitting the high trees, the high leaves, and I was happy watching it happen without it happening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, and, and this is Jack here, assisting, assisting Poetry Essential. So the year that Marie premiered Singularity here at the Universe in Verse, we had a wonderful short film stop motion version of a poem read by another one of our great living po poets um, who was recently inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is also an ordained Buddhist, and it's a poem called Optimism about a tree. To read it for us is a Universe in Verse alumnus from the very first year who has devoted his life to expanding our frames of reference and changing the way we look at reality by bringing science and storytelling into the focal point. And he is, he is a, I would say, a poet in spirit, a storyteller by calling, and musician by training. He is also the son of two scientists. His mother spent 30 years decoding the structure of a single protein. It is my great pleasure to welcome back Jada Bumrat, creator of Radiolab. Hello, everybody. Uh, Maria, you're amazing. Uh, it's quite an honor to be here at the, uh, at the plant. I think trees deserve more ceremonies like this. I, I really agree. Okay, optimism. Um, this very much is a poem that I think speaks to what Maria was saying, that when you plant a tree, you're paying hope forward. Um, optimism by Jane Hirschfield. More and more, I have come to admire resilience. Not the simple resistance of a pillow, whose foam returns over and over to the same shape, but the sinuous tenacity of a tree. Finding the light newly blocked on one side, it turns in another. A blind intelligence, true, but out of such persistence arose turtles, rivers, mitochondria, figs, all this resinous, unretractable earth. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to close with um, a poem by Walt Whitman that has to do with apples and with trees. Now, Whitman was a great lover of trees. To him, the biggest compliment about a human being was to say that they were like a tree. Um, now, I mentioned that I was just in New Orleans um, doing some Whitman-related research for a project of my own, and part of the reason, I mean, so Whitman, Whitman used to work for a newspaper here called the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. He worked for it for two years. This, by the way, was a newspaper that very uh, ardently advocated for the endeavor to build New York City's first public observatory in the middle of the 19th century, which failed. And we are picking up their thread a century and a half later, building it right up here at Pioneer Works, and we are gonna fucking succeed <laughs> but 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 Whitman um, ended his work for the Brooklyn Daily Eagle he was fired for his anti-slavery views the owner of the paper did not share them and there's young Walt Whitman 28 years old suddenly without a job disillusioned and what does he do he's never left New York before he packs up everything he has he takes his 14 year old brother Jeff and he boards a steamer and he goes to New Orleans in part because he's been offered a job by a southern newspaper owner to start a new paper there as editor but mostly I believe to kind of affirm the rightness of his views about the wrongness of slavery. He goes, he goes from a city with a 3% black population to a city with 30% black population. He goes from a place where slavery is this kind of, 
even for the most progressive people, it was still a sort of abstraction, a kind of moral and political bargaining chip. It wasn't, it didn't feel real here in the North. And he goes to a place where human beings are being sold in the street. I mean, this is the man who very soon would declare himself the poet of the body and the poet of the soul. He's watching and sold bodies, sold in the street. And he's just completely shaken by it. He takes an advertisement for a slave auction off a wall in the French Quarter and goes on to keep it for the rest of his life over his desk. He said as a warning, and in fact he ends up writing this poem, really, really powerful, one of his most powerful poems, that takes on the voice of an auctioneer and kind of mocks a slave auction and in order to demonstrate not just the inhumanity but the subhumanity of that whole concept. And so anyway, he's there in New Orleans kind of living in that world, uh, trying to use journalism as a tool for political change, for kind of social change, and very quickly realizing that actually journalism comes right into people's resistances and is not necessarily the most effective way to bypass um, people's existing kind of views on things. And he begins writing poetry more and more, filling his notebook with verses and practicing lines that would eventually become leaves of grass but a big portion of why he actually did that was that there was something else that happened in New Orleans something very private and very profound of which he only spoke once 40 years later and in very vague contours but from what can be discerned from his notebooks and from his diaries is basically that he fell in love and whoever this man was that he fell in love with broke his heart. And it was a kind of unrequited love. Um, although later he would write in one of the short, most beautiful verses from Leaves of Grass how there is no such thing as unreturned love because it's always returned. He says, always paid back one way or another. And without it, I would not have written these songs. So without his experience in New Orleans, both his political and personal awakening, we wouldn't have leaves of grass. So I want to read a poem that is, um, it's actually an excerpt from one of the longest poems in Leaves of Grass, which he revised for the remainder of his life. So for 40 years, he wrote and rewrote obsessively this, this work. And this is, um, this is from a poem that speaks pretty uncannily to our cultural and political moment at the time. It's called A Song for Occupations, and it's a poem that he wrote two and four ordinary citizens of whom he considered himself one, and he was one. He was a working class person. Um, he writes to people who feel disenfranchised, who feel like they have no agency in the outcome of this country, feel like they're cogs in this machine and nothing they do will change the course of their nation, but in fact, he is encouraging them to think differently. And at the same time, it's a, it's a kind of ecological admonition for people to consider that the natural world and reality and everything around us is not just for our use. It's not just for us to make profit from or to turn, even to turn nature into material for science, which to, to use for academic advancement or to turn landscapes into raw material for paintings. And that's the only use of nature. He kind of warns us about the, the human-centric way by which we regard the planet and our place in it. And, and he ends on a beautiful note, inviting us to reconsider who we are and what we're capable of, both as citizens and as a species. So here it is, an excerpt from A Song for Occupations. What have you thought of yourself? Is it you that thought yourself less? Is it you that thought the president greater than you? Or the rich better off than you? Or the educated wiser than you? The sun and stars that float in the open air, the apple-shaped earth and we upon it, surely the drift of them is something grand. I do not know what it is except that it is grand and that it is happiness and that the enclosing purport of us here is not a speculation or bon mot or reconnaissance. 
and that it is not something by which luck may turn out well for us and without luck must be a failure for us, and not something which may yet be retracted in a certain contingency. The light and shade, the curious sense of body and identity, the greed that with perfect complacence devours all things, the endless pride and outstretching of man, unspeakable joys and sorrows, the wonder everyone sees in everyone else he sees, and the wonders that fill each minute of time forever, what have you reckoned them for? Have you reckoned them for your trade or your farm work? Or for the profits of your store? Or to achieve yourself a position or to fill a gentleman's leisure or a lady's leisure? Have you reckoned that the landscape took substance and form that it might be painted in a picture? Or men and women that they might be written of and songs sung? or the attraction of gravity and the great laws and harmonious combinations and the fluids of the air as subjects for the savants, or the brown land and the blue sea for maps and charts, or the stars to be put in constellations and named fancy names, or that the growth of seeds is for agricultural tables or agriculture itself, Old institutions, these arts, libraries, legends, collections, and the practice handed along in manufacturers, will we rate them so high? Will we rate our cash and business high? I have no objection. I rate them as high as the highest. Then a child born of a woman and a man I rate beyond all rate. We thought our union grand and our constitution grand. I do not say they are not grand and good, for they are. I am this day just as much in love with them as you. Then I am in love with you and with all my fellows upon the earth. We consider Bibles and religions divine. I do not say they are not divine. I say they have all grown out of you and may grow out of you still. It is not they who give the life, it is you who give the life. Leaves are not more shed from trees or trees from the earth than they are shed out of you. We are going to hear um, a bunch of Balkan songs, folk songs, from the region where I grew up, a land of apples, um, performed for us by Vlada Tomova and the amazing women of the Yasna Voices um, New, York, New York City Bulgarian Choir. Um, they have chosen four songs coming from four different Balkan regions, um, each themed around apples. One is a love song, one is a divine religious song coming from Greece, Macedonia, Bulgaria, and um, really kind of celebrating the polyphony of this apple tree and of the apple as a cultural and cross-cultural symbol. Um, it is my tremendous pleasure to welcome the amazing choir of these wonderful voices. Si 
coming and welcome to our beautiful tree and thank you Sam and Marissa and all the amazing artists tonight and the poets thank you have a wonderful evening <laughs>